Now, by way of review, as we walk through the message, um, there's a couple of things I want you, I want you to get this big idea um, in your spirit, and then we're going to just talk through what God is laying on my heart this morning. Number, here's what the big idea said, is that we come to know God by experience as we obey him and he accomplishes his work through us. Y'all repeat that after me on the count of three. Come on, one, two, three. Come on, say it. We come to know God by experience as we obey him and he accomplishes his work through us. Very, very important statement. I'll try to flesh that out just a little bit this morning. Um, if you have not, if you've been missing the series, I want to encourage you to go online or in a church app. You can download it, listen to it. It'll kind of get you caught up to speed. So here's three things that we share with you last week as it relates uh, to the message. Number one, God wants us to know who he is. That's a very, very important statement as it relates to developing a relationship with God. He wants us to know who he is. Here is what, and this is all connected with the story of Joshua, if this is your first Sunday, as Joshua has been taking the people across the Jordan. Joshua said to the Israelites, here is how you will know that the living God is among you, is what he said in the third chapter of Joshua. So number one, God wants us to know who he is. Secondly, if we're going to know who God is, we must obey him. Repeat out of me. Say, I must obey God. Very, very important because you can't know who God is if you're not willing to obey him. Does that make sense? I must obey him if I want to know who he is. So let me, let me make sure you're tracking with me. Number one, he wants us to know who he is. Number two, for me to really know him, I must obey him. And lock into what the third thing said that we shared with you last week is when we obey him, he accomplishes his work through us. Okay, so here's what that means. God will not work in disobedient vessels, right? The more obedient I am to God, the more I experience God, and the more I know God. Does this make sense? So then here's the, 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 where I want to pick up this morning, and I want to talk through the, this as we pick this up with the text. Number four says this, we come to know God by experience now, as he works through us. Now repeat out of me. Say, I come to know God by experience as he works through me. Now go to the book of Joshua chapter 3. I'm going to pick up here and then we're going to talk, talk through this so you can hear and see um, what God is saying and what God is, is doing there. Now here's, here's lock into this. Here, um, well, let me back up. I want to walk through this real quick because this is very, very important. So Joshua chapter 3, and then now notice with me a couple of things in the text, and then we're going to talk about what God is saying here. If you look with me um, in verse 7, let's read there, and then we're going to talk. Through. Notice what he says in verse 7. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Let me read that one more time because that's a very, very important statement. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And then let me read verse 8. We've been talking about this. As for you, Joshua, the Lord said to him, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in it. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord. Look at verse 10. And he said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you. Now, what is so critical about this as we kind of talk through the text this morning, that we come to know him by experience. We come to know by experience. Here's what you need to know about Joshua that maybe we'll start to put this thing in perspective and put it in pers um, for you and put it in perspective for me. God wants us to know him. Um, for us to know him, we must obey him. When we obey him, he works through us and when, we, when he works through us and we experience him, we end up knowing him, okay? So understand with me now, at the time of the text, this was the beginning of Joshua's leadership career. Are you guys tracking with me? 
Joshua has, has led for many, many years, but it was under the shadow of Moses. He had never stepped out on his own to say, I am leading, I am in charge, I am running things, I am giving people direction as it relates to what God is saying. If you were to back up to the beginning of chapter 1 of the book of Joshua, what you're going to find is that a transition had taken place. Moses died, and Moses now has left the scene. Moses has gone off the scene, and in his transition, Moses deputized Joshua to say, Now, Joshua, the Lord is transferring the mantle onto you, and now you have the responsibility to lead the people of Israel. And here's the first task that Joshua has, is to lead them across the Jordan. Now, the reason I want y'all to press this with me when we talk about we come to know God by experience as he walks through us, everything that the Israelites up until this point in time in history had experienced of God, it was done through Moses. Come on, y'all tracking with me. Let, me. let me back up a little bit in case you're not getting this. Moses was the one who went to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. Y'all remember that? Moses was the one who released who God worked through to release the ten plagues on the Israelites. Y'all know this. Moses was the one that raised his staff and the Red Sea was parted and they crossed over on the Red Sea. Moses was the one that while they were in the wilderness and they were crying because they were hungry, that God spoke through Moses to provide the manna for them. Moses was the one that God used with the pillar of cloud on the pillar of fire. And for 40 years while they were in the wilderness, Moses was their God representative. Come on, does this make sense? This, this is important information. And, and so now Moses is off the scene and Joshua comes on the scene. And if you're in that crowd, you're looking at Joshua. Hey, dude, we know God was with Moses. Is he with you the same way he was with Moses? All right, lock into this. Because, I mean, they're human, right? Moses got us in this mess. Can you finish it? Right? We know, we know, we know Moses' anointing. We know, matter of fact, we saw when Moses was up in the mountain and he came down, how the glory of God was all over him. So we know where Moses is. Where are you? Oh, y'all. Now, I need, to, I need to work on this a little while because, you see, I'm going somewhere with this. You, you can't follow God or you can't say you know God based on someone else's relationship with God. All right? So, so here's what God is saying to Joshua. Joshua, today I'm going to exalt you, and the people now are going to know that just like I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. Does anybody in here want to know that God is with you just like he was with Grandma and them? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Does anybody want to know that God is with you? Come on, just like he was with the people of yesterday. I don't know about you, but that's my cry. So here's the deal. If I'm going to know God, I've got to obey him. Come on, come on. I've got to avail myself for him to work through him. And it is in the experiences that I get to know God. So let me say this. Let me belabor the point just a little bit more. Joshua had no experience with God. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Here was Joshua's experience with God. Moses would go, encounter God, and God would work through Moses. And here's what Joshua would be. Wow. I'm going to grow up to be like you. Wow. Okay. He had no experience with God. So here's what this sounded like last week. He knew about God. But he didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Difference between knowing him and knowing about him. He had seen him move. He had heard stories of what God could do. He had witnessed how God worked through someone else. But for Joshua himself, he did not have experience with God like that. And let me go as far as to say, and the people themselves, even though God had graced them, even though God had blessed them, 
they had never experienced God the way they're about to experience him right now. So, so here's what God said, said to Joshua. He said to him, I want you to, to tell the people that as soon as the, pre, the priests put their feet in the Jordan, he says, I'm going to stop the water and listen to the difference now. I'm not just going to roll up the water on the side of each of you. He said, I'm going to stop it as far away as Adam. And when you do the work in the text, that's about 19 miles away from where they were crossing. Now, the reason I liked it, and I think that that was important, because when God moves in today's age, God wants to do something that's a lot more phenomenal than what he did in yesteryear. Oh, y'all got to hear me say this. L lock into this. Go, go back to Moses' experience with God. Here is how God used Moses. Raise up your staff, Moses, and I'm going to part the water. And Moses raises up his staff, and the water is parted. Now, here's what you need to know. If I'm there, and if you're there, and I'm crossing the Red Sea when the staff was raised, I'm walking like this. And I'm watching that wall of water. Because at any point in time, oh, y'all not hearing me. I'd never experienced God, so I'm, I, I'm believing him, but I'm walking in fear. Oh, I wish I had somebody. Oh, oh, come on, come on. Let, let me get down. I'm too far from y'all because don't act, don't act like you believe him and you don't get fearful sometimes. So, so in Moses' encounter, I'm crossing, and even though I'm crossing, I can see the wall of water. Matter of fact, I'm crossing. Man, look at the fishies. <laughs> Man, I'm crossing. And I'm wondering if that shark's going to come out the water and get me. I'm crossing, and God is moving, but I'm walking in fear. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Maybe you'll get why David says, yeah, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will what? Fear. Yeah, y'all get it. Yeah. Because sometimes when you're walking in someone else's anointed, even though you know God still can move, there's an element of fear. Because you haven't experienced him like that for yourself. And here's what God says to Joshua. When I use you, there's going to be no fear. Because hear this, you won't be walking looking at water. I won't even let you see it. The reason I want you all to hear this is because tomorrow God wants to do something new. Tomorrow God wants to do something fresh. So if you were here when we began the series, he says, circumcise yourself because I'm about to do a new thing. And this new thing that God wants to do, even though there's a natural tendency to be fearful, God still wants us to trust him, not in fear, because he's going to move things so far away that if you are open to the move of God, if you want to know him and you obey him and he works through you, when you trust him, he will deal with fear. Are you hearing me? Very, very important thing. Because the reason a lot of us don't obey him right now, it's the element of fear. Will he or won't he? And so here's how we step in the Jordan. We hang on to the side and we put our big toe in. Come on, y'all. We don't just let go and walk. We hang on to the side, and we put our big toe in. You don't believe me? God says, get rid of the thing. And you said, God, I'm going to give you one page. I'm going to keep 40 just in case. The element of fear. And he wants to do it. He wants to deal with that. He wants to deal with that. Because if, he's gonna, we, if we're going to know him, he, he works through us. And it's, it's in the experiencing of him that we know him. It is when we experience him that we know him. It is when we experience him that we know him. It is when we experience him. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again because I want somebody to experience God today. It is when we experience him that we know him. It is when we experience him that we know him. Joshua had heard about him. Joshua had not yet experienced God working through him. The people of Israel had heard about him, but remember with me, these were not the same people that came out of Egypt. Y'all do know that, right? 
those that came out of wilderness in Egypt died in the wilderness because of what? Listen to this. Did, yeah, you got it. They had heard about him, but they made the choice not to know him like that. So because of disobedience, they stayed in the wilderness for 40 years. Joshua did not know him like that, and he was about to. Now, church, let me say this. If you and I can ever get to the place where we obey God, and God works through us, we would be amazed at what we would know about God. Let me, I did this Wednesday, so let me, some of y'all weren't here Wednesday, so let me just give you this example, and I'm going to move on to the last thing I want to share with you. Moses, remember this with me about Moses. Moses was raised in Egypt, okay? Now, here's what you need to know about Moses. Moses was born, let me use the term loosely, and, and y'all don't, 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 don't get religious on me. He was born in, to a home that knew of God. Knew about God. So lock into this. His mama told him about God. His daddy told him about God. He knew so much about God that even though when he found himself in Pharaoh's house in Egypt and he saw an Egyptian killing a Hebrew, beating a Hebrew, here's what he did. Because of his knowledge about God, he functioned on behalf of God and he killed the Egyptian. Now, the reason I'm saying that, okay, I'm, because if you know about him and you don't know him, you risk moving out of his timing and you get yourself in trouble. His knowledge about caused him to end up 40 years in the wilderness, okay? Now, you would think all that he knew about would have been enough for him to trust God and to know God like that. Remember with me now. He killed the Egyptian. He goes into the wilderness for 40 years. And then God shows up to him in the form of a burning bush. And then says this, Moses, Moses. If his knowledge about God had translated into knowledge of God, here's what his response should have been. Hey God, I've been waiting for you. But here's what he says. Who are you? He knew about him, but he didn't know him. Why I'm saying that? At that point in time, he had no experience with God. I need you all to hear this. He had no experience with God. So here's what he said. Hey, God. Hey, dude, who are you? And here's what God says. I am that I am. What kind of name is that? Well, in Egypt, all the gods have a name. Moses, I can be whatever you need me to be whenever you need me to be it. I am God all by myself. Dude, I've heard about you, but I've never met you. What can you do that they can't do? Because he'd never, yeah, come on, y'all, he's never what? Come on, y'all, he's never what? I want y'all to say he's never what? So here's what God says. Hey, dude, put your hand in your shirt. So he sticks his hand. And then God says, pull it out. And he said, whoa, man, I'd never seen that in Egypt. He says, I'm the God above Egypt. Put it back in. Take it back out. Whoa, dang, man, you're serious. One experience. One experience. So he know him of Jehovah Rapha, the God that can heal. Y'all get this, y'all get this, y'all get this. <laughs> what else can you do? What's that in your hand? Drop it. Bam. Whoa, man. It's a, dang, dude. They don't even do that in Egypt. Pick it up by the tail. Dang. It's a rod again. Listen to this. Two experiences. Yeah, y'all get it. Y'all get, get it. Y'all get it. So, so after 40 years of hiding, running from Pharaoh, Knowing about God, two experiences with God gave him the boldness that when God said to him, I need you now to go to Pharaoh to tell him, let my people go. Man, if you can do that, them gods in Egypt don't have nothing on you. Where Pharaoh at? 
y'all get it. You get it. You get it, right? (laughs) Knowing about until you encounter and you experience him, you really can't work for him until he works through you. Then all of a sudden, even though there's wanted sign posted all over the post office of Egypt, even though bounty hounders are looking for him, even though his name is inscribed in the wall, wanted dead or alive, his relationship and his experience with God gave him the boldness to come out of hiding and to go face Pharaoh knowing that because of what God said, no demon in Egypt could touch him because of how God spoke to him. Now listen to this. You're not going to like this. The reason we stay in hiding, because we know about, we really don't know. Because when you know him, guess what will happen? You come out of hiding. Folk on your job going through stuff. Here's what you say. Girl, I know they say we can't talk about God up in here, up in here. But let me tell you something. Y'all not hearing me. This is what he did for me. Are you with me? Girlfriend going over there struggling with her marriage. I know we can't talk about God up in here. But let me tell you what he did for my marriage. When you experience him, there's a level of boldness. There's a level of boldness that comes over us because now we don't know about him, we know of him. Okay? So here's the deal. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I know him as a healer. You might know him as something else. My knowledge of him might be a little different than your knowledge, but here's what I learned this week. I was talking to one of our elders. Imagine how much knowledge together we have of God. So, so, so we come to know him by experience as he works through. As he works how? Through. As he works how? So, so here's the bottom line for this, this movement number four that I'm going to wrap this up. If you have not experienced him, you know about him, but you really don't know him. And don't, don't get this twisted. Knowledge about him will give you a level of boldness to do certain things but then you'll feel guilty afterwards because you did it in fear. He killed the Egyptian and he went and hid because he was. Yeah, y'all get it. You get it. Okay. So now, lock into this last thing and then, then we're going to wrap this up. I want y'all to hear this. So, so here's a, the third thing, the final thing I want you to take away from, from this series. And then we're going to pick this up as we, we move on. This is very, very important because we're going to land here. When we experience God, we should memorialize the experience to serve as a what? Testimony to our descendants of God's what? Faithfulness where? Okay, one more time, one more time. It's going to make sense in a little while. When we experience God, we should memorialize the experience to serve as a testimony to our descendants of God's faithfulness where? Good. Revelation says it this way. In the middle of the tribulation, when everybody was giving up and running and hiding, here's what it says. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the what? Word of their what? Testimony. So let's read. Let's read. Go with me now to Joshua. Let's jump down to chapter 4. And let me show you a couple of things in chapter 4. And then we're going to wrap this up. Look with me at verse 1 of chapter 4. One through seven. Let me read this. Say amen if you're there. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly. And it says, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. And take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder. How? According to the number of tribes of the people of Israel. That this may be, I love this word, a sign among you. 
When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Come on, say a memorial. Say it again, say a memorial. Jump down to verse 19. Jump down to verse 19. Look with me, look with me at verse 19. The people came out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped in Gilgal on the east of the border of Jericho. And these twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know that Israel passed over the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you pass over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we pass over. Let me read that last because that's very important. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you pass over as the Lord your God did uh, to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we pass over. Look at the point again very carefully. When we experience God, we should memorialize the experience to serve as a testimony to our descendants of God's faithfulness to us. Say memorials. Here's what this looked like. If you, I've achieved certain things in life, right? And God has graced me to achieve certain things in my life. So I have at home a memorial room, right? Here's what my memorial room looked like. It's my office at home. I graduated high school. My memorial is on the wall. Y'all get it. I went to college, right? My memorial is on the wall. Y'all get it. Well, between high school and college, I went to the military. That memorial is on the wall, okay? Then after I graduated college, I went to grad school. That memorial is where? Um, yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying. Then after grad school, I went to postgraduate school, completed that, and that memorial is what? So much so that I have a picture in my office that, that one of my elders gave me depicts the whole um, my undergraduate experience that's on my wall. So when my kids or grandkids walked in the room and they look at my memorials on the wall, here's what some of them say. Grandpa, I didn't know that about you. Wow, when did you do that? What was that for? What was that? And I can say to them, son, daughter, see what dad did? If you stay focused and get a good education, it'll get you somewhere. My memorials carry a story of my life. You guys are getting this. Okay? Some of you all have memorials. Amen. Some of y'all got so much memorials, you can't get in the room. All right? <laughs> but, but, but the memorials tell the story of your life. Here's what God said. When you experience me, build a memorial. Uh, and the memorial ain't about you and what you did. Because you obeyed me and you wanted to know me. And in your obedience, I work through you, and now you experience me. Build a memorial to remind you of the experience. Now, lock into this. Not only for you, but it's for your children down the road so that they can obey me because of you. Oh, you got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. So your children tomorrow could obey you, I mean, obey me, because of your obedience. He, he, listen, listen. Daddy and I didn't have the best relationship growing up. You've heard this story. But I'm standing here because of his faith in God. Are you with me? Come on now. Are you with me? Some of you in here are, are still here because of grandma's memorial. Come on. Because of your parents' memorial or their great-grandparents' memorial. They prayed you through. Come on. When you were walking and all you do was knew him. They kept you through. So here's what he says. Here's what he says. And lock into this. 
The only reason those people were able to exercise faith to put their foot in the Jordan is because they had heard that God did it for Moses and their daddy and them. And that was enough to give them the confidence to get their own. Oh, I wish I had. To get their own experience. Does this make sense? So, 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 stop living like this. Don't tell your children, do as I say, not as I do. Live a life. Bible puts it this way. Train up a child. How? In the way of he should go, that when he's what? Oh, he will not want, or he or she will not want, depart from it. So when God moves, when God moves, it's very, very important that we set up memorials. We set up memorials. We set up memorials to reflect or to mark the place where God moved and where God blessed. You're going to see why in a little while, and then, then we're going to wrap this up. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, no, that's, that's not the one I want you to see real quick. Okay, here's the, this one right here. Okay. Memorials now, they serve as spiritual markers of our experiences with God. Let me help you out with this because this might not make sense. When God does something for you here, here's what he says. Mark the place. Then when I move over here and I say I want to do something new and you want to know me differently and you obey me and I work through you and you experience me, mark the place. Then when I move you over here and I do something through you and because you wanted to know me differently and you obeyed me and you experienced me, mark the place, okay? Because here's what memorials do. When you get over here and I'm about to do something that you've never seen me do before, you can look back, I wish I had somebody, at my history. Yeah. You can look back at my faithfulness. You can look back at the fact that I was young and old but never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You can look back at the move of God and, and the history of how I moved will give you the strength, the faith, the confidence, the courage to take what? Yeah, yeah. Here's what people say to me. Pastor Felix, you so crazy about God that you believe anything God says. Duh. <laughs> right? Let me give you a little history of memorials that I've set up. Pastor Katana and I were at a thriving ministry initially. When we came to Denver, God said move. Okay? Stepped out into nothing. God provided. Started this ministry. Some of y'all are still here. Small core group of us on, in West Middle School. God moved us from west to just around the corner on Colfax. Before we left west, we set up a memorial. Oh, yeah, yeah. Went out to Colfax. And check out the reason for the memorial on Colfax. The city says, hey, y'all need to move out the building because we're going to condemn it. Hey, city, we can't afford to move. Here's what the city said. Don't worry about it. We'll buy out your lease. And we'll give you the down payment for the next place. So set you up in the next place. So we set up a memorial. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not, hear not, hear not hear me. So we got two memorials. We move over to Norfolk, business person. And we walked in there. Oh, we like this place. We can do good church in here. Met with the owner. Owner says, it's going to cost you a whole lot of money to come in. And we said, we don't have no money. But our God does. And then he says, yeah, I get your God and I get all that, but I operate on greenbacks. I need me some money. And here's the deal. Hey, God said, you got to let us in, man. I'm making the story short. Prayed and did what we need to do. Went back to the congregation and said, hey, guess what? The owner let us in. Y'all not hearing me. Yeah, set up a memorial. Y'all get what I'm saying? He set up a memorial. And so now we're in this place over here. and We've outgrown it a little bit. Time to move because God has a big vision for us. Spent a lot of money to finish the work, a lot of all that good stuff to do what we need to do. And then now God is saying, step out, right? And the majority of the congregation, it says, why do we need to leave here? Where are we going to go? Where? I said, because God said, God said, God said, 
God said that this isn't it. God said, right? So, so we set up a moral because God blessed us and we stepped out into nothingness. Y'all not hearing me. Nothingness. Come on. We talking about going to Hinkley High School, setting up tearing down every week. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Setting up tearing down all the time. Then going out to from Hinkley High School to Crown Plaza, setting up tearing up all the time. Y'all not hearing me. Going through all that stuff. Then at um, Crown Plaza, I end up with cancer. Y'all not hearing me. Oh, Lord, I'll lead a fit in the die. Something must be wrong. Come on now. And, and God take you through stuff such that we come to this place and we see this place. And in the meantime, we've got prayer warriors released and they're praying and they're seeking God and they're doing what God says. Y'all not hearing me. We ended up putting a tent in the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I talk about this, I can see that white tent because it's still a memorial to the faithfulness of God. Such that in the middle of that white tent, the owner of this building comes to us and says, I've seen your memorial. Yeah. You must believe in God that he gave us all the vacant land around this building. Sold us this building, carried the finances, $2.3 million worth of assets that the Lord gave us. Tell me what God won't do. We have a track history because of memorials. People walk into the conference room and they see all these pictures that some they've never seen before. Y'all going to do that? Where you going to get the money? Let me tell you about my first memorial. Let me tell you about the second memorial. Heck, let me skip ahead to the last memorial. Build a memorial. Does this make sense? Build a memorial. So you can look back when God calls you to do the impossible. You have a history of his faithfulness. You have a history of his faithfulness. You have a history of his faithfulness. Does this make sense? You have a history of his faithfulness. I'm almost done. I don't have time to go to the scriptures, but lock into this. Memorials come out of the place of our experience with God. So here's what this means. Get your own memorial. You can't talk about what God did for grandma. He going to do for me. No, 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 no. Get your own memorial. Because listen to the text. Take the stones out of the place of your crossing. Where I moved, picked up the stones. And when you get to where you're going, build a memorial. And when your kids see it, what's that for? Let me tell you all what God did. Get your own memorial. Okay? Because here it will happen if you don't get your own memorial. You'll do ministry out of fear. You'll cross. You'll cross. But you'll be looking at that wall of water, wondering if it's going to come down. And you won't be comfortable. When you get your own memorial, 19 miles away, he blocks it up. You don't even see what he's doing. You just walk it out. <laughs> finally, finally, worship team come, Pascatani come, elders come. Memorials remind us of our need to continually Revere God. Let me end with this. Look at the last verse. Look at me at verse 24 of chapter 4. Here's what God says. So that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord Almighty, that you may, and it has this word, fear, Hebrew word, yara, fear the Lord your God forever. I like the translation revere, honor, worship. So here's what memorials look like. Whenever the Israelites saw those stones and it reminded them of the Jordan being parted and they crossed over on dry ground, they prostrate themselves before God. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you, praise you. When I think, when I think of the faithfulness of God, and how faithful God has been to me and to this ministry, it forces me to my face to thank him. Heck, when I think of how faithful God has been to me in my life, guess what it does? 
it presses me to my face to worship him. Remember God. Remember God. He thought so much of you. He thought so much of me that he left his home in glory. He came and he gave his life. And he says, Felix, church, I love you so much. I'm willing to die for you. At the point of my salvation, there's a memorial. God, thank you for saving a wretch like me. And God, you did it so I can be free. So I can be whole. And so I can tell everyone that I know that he loved me so. Bow your heads with me wherever you are. I want you to reflect on the memorials of your life. Take a moment just to reflect on the memorials of your life. I know I've said a lot about knowing God and knowing about God versus knowing him. Here's what I want to say to you by way of encouragement. If you have a memorial, you know him there. So don't let nobody tell you you don't know him in that thing. The challenge is to get as many as you can. Take a moment just to worship him. Take a moment just to worship him. Then we're going to go to the Lord's table and allow God to be God in our midst this morning. What an awesome, what a wonderful God we serve. What a gracious God. We bless his name. He deserves it. You thought I was worth saving. He bless you. So you came to change my life. You thought I was worth keeping. Bless you. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life so I can be free, so I can be whole, so I can tell everyone I know. You thought I was worth saying.